And I think we are now live. Today is Wednesday, 19th of December, and this is the Facebook Ads Power Hour with me, Deepesh Mandalia. Um, really excited to introduce my guest today, but just before I do that, this is actually the last Power Hour show of 2018, and it's been a real cool journey. It's something I started about six months ago, really to bring on people onto the show that I wanted to actually genuinely speak to, and you guys get to watch it, and also join in at the end with a Q&A as well. So for those of you that are live right now, hit hashtag live if you have any comments, any questions for Jason or myself later on. Um, and if you're on the replay, type in hashtag replay so that we know that we can come back later and kind of check out your question. Um, and if you are live right now, give me a shout, give Jason a shout so that we know you're there. And also the engagement helps the video to get promoted and all that kind of fancy Facebook stuff. Hey, Francois, how are you doing? Um, so I'm really excited to meet, uh, speak to Jason. So we, um, we've, we've been online buddies for probably a year, I don't know. Um, and we actually got to meet in Barcelona and we had a really, really good conversation. Uh, we've got some kind of similar ideas and experiences when it comes to the kind of tech and uh, machine learning side of Facebook ads. And it was good to speak to someone at Jason's level of those kind of in-depth things as well. So we're gonna cover off um, some of Jason's background and. Uh, I'll go through some questions and you can find out a bit more about what he's up to and uh, it's, it's really, really cool stuff. And then we'll go into a Q&A. So um, get those questions fired up. You can post the questions in as we're talking and we'll come back through and answer as many of those questions as we can in the next hour or so. So let me introduce my guest for today, Jason Kreisky. How are you doing, Jason? Doing really well, Josh, thanks. Awesome. It's great to have you with us today. Um, so I'll hand over to you. So give us a quick introduction of who you are, what you're representing, who you're representing, and to kind of give the, give the viewers an idea of what's in store over the next hour or so. Yeah. So um, I've been in the kind of digital um, marketing space for about 10 years now. I could go through that whole uh, lot of stuff happened there. Um, but uh, right now I'm a chairman of a company called Straw House, which is like a, a venture growth agency where we uh, grow digitally native direct to consumer brands, uh, leveraging primarily Facebook and Instagram advertising, but we also do other, other channels as well. And uh, we have like an innovative model where we kind of deploy our own capital to help grow those brands. And sometimes we take equity in them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, and also, I've uh, started a new company uh, where I'm CEO. It's called uh, Uncoil.ai, and that's a uh, tool that's built to really make e-commerce advertising and media buying easier using a lot of machine learning and data aggregation. Um, yeah, so over the next uh, little bit here, we're going to talk about, I guess, my uh, kind of path through that and all the kinds of crazy shit we're doing. Awesome. Um, so I like to kind of... Um start the questioning by actually asking a kind of blue ocean question. If you weren't doing what you're doing right now, what would you absolutely love to be doing? Empty canvas, anything you want. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate in that I am kind of, you know, it's hard for me to imagine something else doing what I'm doing now. Um, you know, we're moving towards, you know, a an investment model where we can grow and conceptualize, um, you know, digital brands, and then, um, you know, leverage, uh, you know, more like venture and private equity money to really make those things really big. Um, I think there's a lot of times we kind of under, you know, as like digital marketers, we don't really fully value our skills, and so we don't think about how important or how impactful they can be, particularly when it comes to making really big companies. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Really, uh, really happy doing that. If I wasn't doing that, I'd probably just own a chain of porchetta sandwich shops. Um, I just fucking love sandwiches. So, <laughs> Awesome. And, and where are you based? You're in Canada, right? Yeah. So I'm in British Columbia, Canada, just about a three-hour drive east of Vancouver. Awesome. Um, so I was in Calgary this summer, and I really, really wanted to get out to Vancouver and kind of cross by your way. But the forest fires were insane. I don't know if that's like a common thing for you guys, but it was... Uh, where we were in Calgary, which is some miles away from you guys, it was like, um, it was surreal. The sun in, in daytime looked literally red um, with all the kind of cloud cover and stuff. Yeah, it was uh, probably the worst year I've ever seen. So um, it was, there was a stretch for like two weeks where the street lamps were on all day because it was so dark in town because of this crazy smoke cover. 
Absolutely. Um, shout out to Naveen, Rick, Charles, and Pablo. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so how did you actually get into Facebook ads? Yeah, so like I said, I got into digital about 10 years ago um, through email. I was a deliverability engineer, so I was actually figuring out how to inbox and deliver email, and then I got into more of the kind of marketing and list management side, and I uh, did that for a while, and then realized that um, you know it was getting harder and harder to deliver email, even though we were using some like subversive tactics um, because of the kind of increase in computing power and machine learning that companies like you know gmail early on were, were employing um so i saw the writing on the wall and thought that um unless they made a transition in how i was managing that business that it wasn't going to go that well so at that point in time about six years ago um i started getting interested in facebook um which was kind of like not too long after i think they started newsfeed ads and i met my co-founder of straw house navid um and uh, he was a media buyer and uh, we lived in the same town and we just started kind of going back and forth and i was building uh, infrastructure for social advertisers who were maybe doing things that they shouldn't be doing and uh yeah and so started that way and then um just started working with um, more mainstream companies after that cool and what kind of um successes have you seen with facebook ads in that time yeah we've been um, really fortunate in that um you know, I try and keep one eye on the future, you know, to look and see, you know, where the trends are going, what is being material, and then simultaneously, you know, establishing good relationships with, um, you know, people in those traffic companies that can help really kind of color that and give you perspective. And um, if you understand, you know, what, uh, what their goals and strategies are, you can kind of back, backfill that into like what you should be doing. Uh, or where to best position yourself. So when Facebook video um, launched as a beta uh, ad unit, we were, uh, you know, we had a good relationship with Facebook. We got really early access to video. And in those early days, Facebook assumed that uh, video, they didn't know they were gonna be a video platform yet. They just, you know, thought it was gonna be for like brand ads, like there'd be commercials like on TV, but on Facebook. And That's right. We uh, tested a bunch of different things and found that we could loop like, you know, 10 second videos um, of, uh, you know, a variety of different things uh, that would just kind of, you know, catch people's eye. And at that point in time, when Facebook releases a new ad unit, they're generally like um, depreciated the cost in the auction to promote the usage That's of that right. ad unit. So uh, nobody was really on it. We were really early and we were working with a company um, that had a highly scalable physical product uh, that we were able to scale up to like, I think the tuna, like maybe we're spending two, two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a day for wow. a pretty long period of time. That was, okay. that was like, that was like the, the, probably the biggest one that we've done. That was maybe three years ago. So, so talk me, talk me through, um, managing a six figure daily spend because there aren't many people that have been able to do that. And a lot of people look at that and they're kind of um, wowed by it. And it's, it looks like an amazing thing. How, how did you manage that day to day in, in terms of kind of managing the account and also managing your stress levels and everything else associated with it? You know, I think just to touch on that stress level component first, one of the th is really human beings are amazing. It's amazing how quickly someone can become accustomed to something. And then it's kind of like you're just your new normal. When you're in a position where you have no choice but to accept it as it is and then manage it appropriately. So, um, you know, we were a pretty pretty small team of about six people at that time. And, uh, you know, we were obviously we had uh, that spend spread out over, uh, uh, you know, quite a few accounts and campaigns. And um, it, it was more about... Um, because of, of our model where we're using our own capital, it was about like like figuring out the right uh, efficiencies to get money back in to continually paying off those credit cards to be able to move that forward. Um, you know, I, I have to give my you know my partner to be a lot of credit. Like he was the one who was responsible for actually um, you know managing um, that that budget, and uh, I was more on the business side of that, ensuring that we were able to continue to scale um, with our with our advertiser, but. Um, I remember one weekend we went away to like a little fishing village and, uh, you know, really spotty internet. And if like, you know, the website would have went down, 
then you know we would have been losing twenty thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> and you're waiting there for the page to load. I'm like I hope it loads. Um, that was dumb, but you know it, it, it's just a kind of a illustrates like how quickly something can become normal. Absolutely. Um, and in terms of straw house, how did you kind of operationalize Facebook ads for the agency and kind of be able to take that to many accounts and grow your company that way? Yeah, we've tried um, a variety of different ways um, to achieve that. So, um, you know, like with many media buyers, they're, you're kind of a full stack um, individual in terms of like uh, copywriting, um, you know, uh, image graphic, you know, creation, you know, build, building the hooks and then actually managing the ads. And um, that's been something that we've done for quite a while. And then we've moved more into, um, and we're moving even more into like, uh, you know, taking an individual who's like, you know, maybe great at creative or great at a really kind of quantifiable, um, you know, data aggregation and analyzation and uh, building teams around people's individual competencies and uh, ensuring that uh, everybody's really focused on what they're good at. Absolutely. Um, so how did you kind of get more involved into the technical side of Facebook? And how did you first kind of find out about the API and start working with it? Yeah, I was just a, uh, I was a nerdy kid, you know, so, um, and I used to be a deliverability engineer, which involved me looking through mail server logs to try and basically find opportunities to um, game mail servers. Um, so I had the, uh, the benefit of like a, a technical background, um, although I'm not a developer. So, but I, but I do uh, definitely understand and appreciate uh, the value in having more data. And once I, you know, was exposed to the API and learned that there was a lot more data in the API than you get in the, uh, you know, Facebook ad UI, uh, I knew that we needed to start collecting it and then finding ways to interpret it to inform our campaigns. One of the interesting things I find about the API is, um, it's actually accessible to anyone. I think people see it as a kind of developer thing and you know have to go through developer stuff. But actually, once you get um, access to the API, you can literally, like one of the cool things is, and I'll probably do a video for this one day, is um, you can go and create your own strings and kind of just paste them in. And you can actually see data come back in a, in a kind of crude format in, in the actual page. Like you don't have to build, you don't need, need a developer as long as you understand the format that Facebook needs, like account number, campaign name, all that kind of stuff, you can start pulling data through. Um, and I think it's, I think there's still so much opportunity. And that's why I was really interested in the work you guys are doing. Because for me, the, the future of kind of media buying on Facebook, a lot of the technical side, I think will go into things like machine learning, because the machines can interpret things faster than we can, and also at a wider scale than we can. So for example, when I was um, doing my own six figure days, we were we had a big media team and we had multiple accounts multiple campaigns and stuff like that but we had a big media team four media buyers working on that account um and we needed to because we needed all the eyes on the data that's why we built our own api system on top of it so we can actually do some of the stuff that you guys um that we we're talking about before we start this call is predicting things and actually looking at when certain things are likely to change so you can be prepared and you can make the decisions before um, they, they have a big negative impact on on your account. Um, and I do do encourage people to have a look at the API because sometimes there's ideas there that other people can bring through as well. I don't think it's necessarily just for developers. Um, and and I, 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 it's actually given me an idea. I do want to create a video for that just to show how simple it is as well. Um, I think it's um, there's even like the ability to string together a couple of different pieces of SaaS software so you don't have to know any coding and then you can pull data into a much more utilize, like um, easy to um, like easily interfaceable place where you can start building yeah. tables out of it and uh, you know figuring things out there. I'm, I'm with you on the machine learning component of media buying. Most really good media buyers subconsciously are detecting patterns and then behaving predictably based on what they uh, like assume is going to happen. But it's very hard for a human to clearly articulate why many times. That's why many times media buying seems like it's something that's like almost magical to be able to move from one person to another. Yeah. Um, all of this stuff is quantifiable. So if we can build systems to be able to look at things, uh, you know, you're way better off. And as far as the API goes, like, I think even the more interesting thing is like combining um, different uh, Facebook APIs and um, 
you know, that's usually you'll find some really interesting things there. And then Facebook will figure out that you've been able to combine data point A from this API, data point B from that API to be able to discover something that maybe you shouldn't know, but it's a big advantage. So is that something you can share? Any Anything that you've kind of found, which is maybe, you know, un unknown by Facebook themselves that you could do as well? Yeah, uh, out of the bag, I guess. I think the one that, one that we <laughs> like is that because, you know, we've had a very heavily weighted health portfolio for a long time, um, that there is, depending on Facebook's, you know, where they're at, there's a propensity to have different sensitivities from a policy perspective. So one of the things that we built into Uncoil was, um, so you've got your page post, um, you know, ID that you're, um, you're advertising against, you're buying impressions against, but you, you, you only have negative feedback um, as a guidance as to whether or not things are going good or going bad. But lots of times you'll have high negative feedback, high positive feedback, ads making lots of money. You don't exactly want to stop. Um, but maybe you're running into a place where you could run into some future challenges with policy. Uh, by combining in the pages API, you actually get the real time complaints um, that you can, oh, wow. but then you can correlate to the number of impressions served by the ads using that post ID. So you can actually create a spam score. And so if you know where the threshold is, you can ensure that you can like, uh, you know, maybe reduce the impressions being served to that ad, um, to that post ID. If, uh, you know, so if you don't want to run into any policy challenges or account reputation issues. That's amazing. That's fascinating. Is, is that in uncoil as well? Yeah, I think I don't know if we've released it yet, but it'll probably be in the next release. Okay, amazing. Um, so tell tell me a bit more about Uncall, kind of um, how the project started and kind of where you are right now and kind of the steps in between to create what you've got. Because I understand you're in beta, um, but I, I'm keen to kind of know how you got to this stage and kind of where you are right now. Yeah, so this is this is like the third version of this thing that I've made. Um, the first two versions were internal versions that we built in Straw House in order to be um, help our media buyers be more effective by combining that uh, the Facebook ad API data and then um, you know conversion platform data. So Uncoil uh, takes Facebook ad API data and uh, Shopify data. Um, it'll do work with more commerce platforms and more attention platforms in the future. But what we know is that if you're able to take those different data points and then uh, layer in the kind of best practices and the things that we do in our service business, we can build transforms that surface opportunities way, way beyond, um, way faster than you would normally be able to find them. Um, and then you, an individual, one individual can manage way more uh, because they're only paying attention to the alerts that the system's delivering them. And then there's just um, different things that you're not going to be able to normally find unless you're combining that data, stringing it together, building pivot tables, and then um, you know, really knowing how to go hunting for things. So we, we just take all that knowledge that we already have, and then we're kind of like productizing it into a platform. Okay. So can you give me some kind of tangible examples of the decision making that Uncoil makes and what the process is? Is it, um, does it bounce through recommendations and then you action, or can you kind of semi-automate or fully automate that as well? Yeah. So, so currently, um, you know, there's a, like right now it, uh, recommends opportunity, like, uh, when you should you know, pause or cut ads when you should scale ads. We're doing that predictively based off of input data from Facebook. Uh, we're just rolling out next week, um, all the Shopify related insights, and then um, some more unified insights after that. Uh, but there's just a, there's a, there's a, there's a huge variety. And so like, what one of the challenges we're looking at now is how do we, you know, properly, um, you know, rank which opportunities are best pushed up to be able to be actioned. Um, I think, you know, automation will come in the future, um, you know, within maybe the next year, um, hopefully sooner, but we want to make sure that we're providing the most interesting, highest value transforms before we work on automation. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, the first set of tools that I worked on um, outside of our own API were tools like Adespresso, Quaya, and then kind of, um, uh, what's the other one called? ROI Hunter, and then I kind of moved on to Smartly. Now, at the time, two, three years ago, Smartly, for me, was the market leader. And I think it's still up there. I haven't used it recently. Um, how, how did you all talk compare to those guys? So um, our, our tool is really more of a, um, an insight tool. So as opposed to just you know managing your Facebook ad buying through that. Through that okay. Tool, don't, 
like you still with our tool, you have to create the ads in the Facebook. You can action things like pausing and scaling from within our application. But, um, you know, we don't want to have to, we don't want to rebuild a bunch of things that already exist in the next yeah. place. So we want to be able to add more value by uh, focusing on the data science components and taking that data and then um, providing insights that, you know, you can't get anywhere else. Okay. So for, for example, um, with my agency, we use Reveal um, Bot for a lot of our automations, the scaling, the pausing, et cetera. And one of the cool things is it integrates with Slack. And so our kind of whole process management is pivoted around that. So we kind of keep a track on all of the activity and, and kind of what's going on. It comes into Slack. We've got multiple channels for different clients and all the alerts come in. How do how would someone manage um, Uncoil and all the kind of feedback that they're getting? Because sometimes with um, tools like Reveal, you get too much info. And it's really sometimes difficult to separate the high urgency priority stuff from just the regular alerts and stuff. Yeah, so, so right now we're, we have like our own algorithm that, that ranks those um, you know, challenges or opportunities to surface the, the ones that need the highest attention or the ones that are the highest up on the page. It's like a, almost like a card-based feed. Um, but uh, you know, in, in the future, we'll make that a little bit um, easier by adding automation. And as far as notifications go, we're working on a Slack and Messenger integration where you could just action from Messenger if you wanted to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and for for the guys that are online, hey Petra, um, have your questions ready. We're going to go into questions in about five minutes. Um, you can fire the questions in now if you're watching the live. Type hashtag live if you're on the replay. Hashtag replay, and we'll cover off as many questions as we can in around half an hour in five minutes' time. Um, so Jason, with the um, the kind of plans for 2019 and with machine learning, what do you see as being the big kind of pivot? Because I, I do feel that people managing ad accounts is going to become um, less and less of a thing because, you know, for me, Facebook ads is more about the marketing, the creative, the journey, the, the funnels and things like that. The things like automation, I think, will then enable less technical people to actually make more sense of Facebook ads and, and be able to get, make higher profits from it as well. Is that kind of where you see Uncoil coming in? Yeah, I think we're, we're very aligned on that, on that vision. Um, that's basically the reason that I'm building this product. And uh, the future that I see is that as, you know, technology and machine learning continues to advance, um, you know, the, the need for technical media buying will, will be compressed and will go down. And so the real, uh, there'll be a, a kind of a shift in value um, from you know technical ad management and media buying to uh, you know journey and strategy and creative and hooks. Um, and so you know the idea is that if once this platform's kind of like fully actualized, it's a fully operational, uh, we'll be able to uh, you know uh, have a, a copywriter or a designer um, or a, a strategist basically manage all of those inputs. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it should it should um, increase like from a you know capital like efficiency standpoint and say like an agency, you can def have more of your resources focused on um, you know things that are actually driving a lot of value in marketing for your clients. Okay, and in terms of 2019, um, what's coming up with Uncoil? Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to um, push forward on integrations and integrate uh, a few more uh, e-commerce platforms like you know WooCommerce and uh, then more attention platforms like Google and native uh, ads. You know, one, okay. of the, uh, one of the things that I think is really important if you're like an e-commerce brand or if you're, you know, uh, an agency is like you should, you should have a repository of your data that doesn't exist on the platform that you're buying it from. And, and what's really great about, uh, you know, Unqual is it's like your own data lake. So all your data is in one place. It's all, you know, you can start to, uh, like we provide insights, but you can also look at the different relationships between different uh, different things and start to um, have a better understanding on journey. Like our, our big goal at the end of the year is to really automate journey so that we can tell you very clearly if you spend a dollar here, it should should you know represent like three dollars over here across different channels. One of the biggest issues that we face, you know is, um, you know, journey and attribution. So how do you know where 
uh, you know, what the impact of a dollar spent is where, and then what's that, what's the best way to deploy that. So that's really what we're shooting for. Okay. Um, and, I, and I know I mentioned it in Barcelona, but I still do want to sign up. Um, how would I connect my store up in my account? Is there a process to kind of sign up for the beta? Yeah, it's super easy. You can just go to uncoil.ai and, uh, you know, connect Facebook, you can choose which business manager and which accounts you want to connect if you don't want to connect all of them. And then, um, you know, then you connect Shopify, you just authorize both those applications, and it'll start pulling uh, your data in. And then uh, we'll start tagging, we'll add like a little, you know, parameter to the end of your, uh, your new ads, we don't touch existing ads, because we know that's like a no, no. Um, so we, uh, so we'll start taking all the new ads and then you'll get unified commerce and attention data. Okay. Um, and with it being in the beta, is there a cost? Um, right now it's, uh, we haven't been charging for it. We're planning on moving out of beta in January. Uh, it's a two week free trial and like we've, I've, uh, priced the product, like, uh, I think really cost effectively. It's basically. Uh, because we're rerunning these machine learning models like every six minutes, there's like a ton of like data throughput cost and like Google Cloud costs. So I'm trying to like basically break even on, on that. Absolutely. Um, so the short, short answer is like uh, we're going to start charging for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and where do you see Facebook in 2019? Like 2018 is Facebook has taken such a battering from um, all angles. And, you know, one of the interesting things was about. Q4 in particular, and people are saying, you know, Facebook's failing, um, move your spend over to other channels, CPMs are going to go through the roof, Facebook are changing the whole game. Um, yet a lot of us still cut through and made money out of Q4, significant money. And in, into 2019, no one really knows where Facebook is going to be, let's say this time next year. But what's your kind of feeling? Because you're quite involved on the technical front and obviously you've got the agency as well and, and a relationship, I imagine, with Facebook as well. Yeah, I think... Um, we're going to continue to see pressure um, on the API and the data that Facebook's allowing us to have as they realize that they maybe that certain things can be extrapolated from other things. Um, you know, like I think I was just looking today, um, there was an announcement that Facebook gave access to some developers, all of their, all of people's private messages. Um, so like, it's like a nonstop parade of like bad news. Um, mm. I think that like unless people start to change their behaviors as in like they start using the platform less then that'll have an impact on you know obviously the amount of uh, inventory and um, the further competition uh, into how much people want to spend on that so that'll that'll maybe dictate cpms but um i haven't seen uh for like uh you know a little older audiences engagement with facebook is still quite high um you know a lot of uh you know, Gen Z's uh, are not very engaged on Facebook. It's more, you know, Instagram and Snapchat and uh, email. Like we started working way more with email, um, especially with younger people. It's really interesting. Um, I think, you know, having a diversified omni-channel approach is always important, but I don't see Facebook, like us stopping using, utilizing Facebook as a platform in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that there will be in the next few years, there will be some big changes, especially if, if the younger people still move away from Facebook because, you know, they need the new user growth. But still, you know, although countries like UK, US are either at saturation point or reaching saturation point, there's still lots and lots of other countries still growing with Facebook. Um, Eastern Europe, for example, uh, we, I've run lots of e-com campaigns there. And yes, they're not going to scale to eight and nine figures, but you can still make money there. And Facebook is still growing. And I think also countries like India um, and also like Philippines and other places like that, they're they're working on their kind of payment processing, their infrastructure, logistics, et cetera. And they're super, super cheap CPMs. Like I know a lot of people in India right now have um, worked through the cash on delivery methodology of payment. And they're, they're raking in money at the moment. So I think there's still lots of growth. I just think that a lot of people that will suffer will be the ones that try and repeat the same tactics, the same strategies from 2018. And they will suffer because the Facebook itself as a platform continually adapts and different strategies play out. So you have to kind of keep ahead of it as well. How, how do you kind of keep ahead of everything that's happening at Facebook? Um, you know, I read a lot. Um, 
I read, um, you know, books, but I also read a, a ton of, um, of kind of industry press and news. And I kind of filtered that through my own, um, you know, hypothesis and lens. And, you know, I kind of have a, you know, a, a meta, you know, a perspective or a strategy or understanding or assumption on like how the world will be and how these things are either, um, you know, proof points or, you know, in, in either in favor or against. Um, and so I'm constantly like reshaping this mental model and then, uh, you know, applying the decisions and strategies in our business against that. Um, so okay. like, um, and on, on a kind of personal level, what, um, what keeps you motivated and driven to do what you do? Yeah. I mean, I, I just really like making stuff. And um, I like, uh, you know, uh, bringing new people onto our team and you know, elevating their skill sets. And, um, you know, I live in a pretty small town in, in British Columbia, and I like the impact that I'm able to have um, in our community as far as like, I think so between the people that have either like, uh, you know, have moved on from us or, you know, the people that moved on from us, uh, I think has spurned like seven new businesses or something um, in terms of like uh, media and advertising. So I really like having that impact. And then I like the, uh, you know, the ability to really um, see the, the impact that you have, we have in the world in terms of the kinds of uh, positive brands and products that we're moving forward. Um, so it makes me pretty happy. Awesome. Um, we're losing the internet. I think we're back again. Apologies, um, my internet, it just does this. It doesn't like hour long uh, video connections, which is really annoying. Um, but we're going to go into questions. So Jason, I'm going to pull out some questions that the um, guys have posted. So if you're watching the live, put hashtag live so I can kind of go through and pull those out. If you're on the replay, hashtag replay, and we'll try and come back and answer those as well. So we've got a question here from um, Naveen. So does uncoil analyze performance historically re retroactively and two does it integrate with custom shopping carts as well so not just shopify yeah so we, we don't um, analyze uh historical data um because we uh, use this little um, kind of parameter we had onto links um it's all the going forward uh data between uh facebook and shopify um that uh, provides a really interesting insight um, unfortunately, we don't have a way to go back and unify those things. Um, and currently, it's just Shopify, although we're going to be adding in additional commerce platforms here in the next few months. Cool. Um, question from Pablo. As an expert with machine learning, um, he would like to know how long that he needs to wait, if possible, to have a simple software to upload creative for ads in the software with the API and machine learning to automatically create audiences with the creatives uploaded and improve it each day, testing all things and scaling. Yeah, I don't think that's that far away. Um, you know, one mm. of the platforms that we built recently was a machine vision system. So when you upload your creative or your video, we start tagging all the things and um, I forget what it's called, but like not just objects, but like, you know, also like kind of like, um, more uh, um, is it like a like a semantic kind of analysis um, to understand kind of what's happening, and then so we we attach all of those things that we pull out of that image to an audience and to an ad. So as you're moving along, you know, uh, in, on an, in an aggregate sense, uh, we should be able to inform. Say, hey, looks like you're selling boots. You know, use pictures of puppy dogs. Works best to convert um, people for boots. Um, the, what, you, what, uh, what Pablo was referring to specifically, um, you know, isn't that far off. I mean, that's something that we'll have in this platform at some point. It's just not currently prioritized. Um, yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Cause that's, um, actually something I've been looking at as well, because, um, I have a, a kind of testing methodology where I take audiences, creatives, mash them all together to find the winners and, and I have a systematic way of doing this. And actually at the moment we're doing it kind of through RevealBot using automations and cycling different ads into testing. It's not the it's not the most slick way of doing it, but it's allowing us to test at scale. But in terms of the machine learning aspect, um, yeah. so looking to kind of improve each day itself, testing all things and scaling. Yeah. 
is that is that something especially on the machine learning side is that something that you think could work as well yeah so we, we've already built the decisioning around that um so like with machine learning you have to build each kind of component individually and then you need to take that just takes time to be able to get the it to a statistical significance level that is like you know 95 percent some people might say you want to do an order of magnitude less like 65 percent um, in order to be able to learn quicker, but you may miss out on like whether or not, um, you know, your confidence interval is lower, so you may, may, may be wrong or not. Um, but we have like the component built around, you know, cutting ads that's been built. We can predictively determine that within a very um, short amount of, or a very small percentage of the cost of consumer. And then um, scaling is complete as well. So we just need to build um, some unified um, automation um, including the creative component in order to uh, pull all that together. There's probably um, a couple of other pieces that would need to be built there. But yeah, I don't see that being too far away. Cool. Um, there's a note from Naveen. Uh, check out albert.ai. I'm guessing you guys have had a look. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Does that compare to what you're doing? Yeah, so they mostly focused, um, and I haven't looked at them in maybe about a year or so, but they focus uh, largely on, um, on display, I believe. I mean, unless they do Facebook now, I'll have to take a look. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's we're, we're by no means the only people, uh, you know, kind of with this uh, with this goal uh, with this strategy. Uh, but what we're fortunate to have is, um, you know, four or five years of you know hundreds of millions of dollars in and con conversion data to be able to build these models on. Um, because you need a lot of data to be able to build really accurate models. And then you do a lot of time series work to understand how this changes over time. Um, so yeah, we feel like our proprietary data sets helpful in being able to kind of get out ahead and, and be confident that when we release something that it's going to be effective for our users. Absolutely. So, so do, do you think, um, there is a kind of minimum spend level traffic level to make the best out of your software? Yeah, I think uh, there definitely is. Um, that number is like, like maybe uh, a budget of a hundred dollars in ad set, um, but you could have like you know uh, twenty ads or something in there if you wanted. Um, really, we're looking at people who are spending at least a thousand dollars a month on ads to be able to get the the, the best um, the best uh, outcomes. But it, it will work at a lower number. Like the I think the floor number is a hundred dollars. Um, okay. And and um, in terms of the machine learning itself, do you have data scientists working on this, or how do you kind of do all the modeling and stuff? Yeah, no, it's uh, that's the majority of um, you know where we're going. Like we've built kind of primary development on our application, but a lot of the work is all data scientists. So I've got two in-house data scientists, and then uh, I've got like a um, we contract with um, like a like eight PhDs that build all the high level models that we build internally. Okay, and and so your kind of um, your view on the path that it can take. So it's more kind of giving the insights and letting people make decisions from that afterwards. How how would that kind of work with workflows and kind of how um, you know agencies or people that are just running their own ads, how do they kind of integrate that in to make the best out of it? Yeah, so the um, when the insights are provided, it's, they're updated every, I think, like I said, uh, it's um, data comes in real time, the models we run every six minutes. So um, once we have like a good notification system, um, you know, you get a ping into Messenger, uh, it'll tell you what's happening. You can just say yes or no, or pause or whatever you want to say. Um, so right now that's the interface. It's probably not as uh, eloquent as um, automated writing, um, but we want to kind of give people um, the, uh, the opportunity to kind of go through um, and trust and make sure like that they're comfortable with the decisioning. Um, and that was uh, one of those things. I know if I was looking at a new platform, I would kind of want to like look at what it was saying a little bit first to make sure that it, I, I agreed with it. And uh, you know, do some testing and some like you know one or two accounts, and then if I was really happy with it, I'd roll it all out. Um, so our 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 whole uh, kind of process is centered around that. So 
we'll have automation, you know, in the future, you know, maybe six months from now, but we really want to make sure that we're, we're focusing all of our effort on driving the highest value, which is like the insights that you wouldn't be able to determine yourself. So cool. a constraint around like development resources. Awesome. Um, so we're done on questions. Um, how, how do people kind of follow you, follow your journey? What's the best way for them to keep in touch with how things are going? Yeah, you can follow me on uh, Facebook or uh, what's my Facebook name? I don't even know. Um, that's funny. Um, I'll just tag it in this. And then uh, yeah, cool. on, on Instagram, um, where I could do wacky shit on there. And uh, yeah, people can feel free to like, you know, reach out to me and I'm pretty accessible. Awesome. Um, are you planning to attend any events in the next three, six months? Um, I've been going to um, Vegas in January for... Oh, awesome. I'll see you there. See you there? Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I've been going there for like 10 years. And really at this point, um, it's not super relevant to, to me or my business anymore, but I've just got a ton of friends that are there. Um, so it's nice to hang out with people for a couple of days. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. Absolutely. Um, have a great end to the year. Uh, thanks, guys, for joining us on the last Facebook Ads Power of 2018. We'll see you back in 2019. Thanks, Jason. It was great to catch up and looking forward to seeing you in Vegas. Thank you, guys.